Uh, 104.5, the team, your home for New York sports. We now are uh, we're, we're talking to the radio voice, the New York Giants, Bob Papa. And, Bob, looking back on the wild card loss, what was the biggest reason the Giants were defeated by the Packers in your mind? Well, I think it's pretty obvious, right? I mean, the first quarter and a half when the Giants only led 6 nothing. I mean, they could have easily been up 14 nothing, 17 nothing, and you're dropping passes left and right. Uh, that go for first downs or for touchdowns. That was a killer for the football team. Uh, and then bad special teams play. Uh, you know, pinning yourself by fielding punts inside the 10 uh, and, and then giving up the Hail Mary at the end of the first half. But with that said, five minutes to go in the game. They're down 14-13. Green Bay marches down the field to go up 21-13. And then they're about to kick the ball out of bounds. I mean, and if the Giants start at the 40, maybe they can change the momentum back their way. And when Rainey made that bonehead play, it was almost as if, you know, the ceiling collapsed on the Giants' season. Bob, I feel like a bonehead asking this question, but I have to because our listeners want to know, did you think the boat in Miami factored into this game in any way, shape, or form? No, I don't think it did, but I think, you know, it created an unnecessary distraction, and it put additional pressure on those guys to now have to go out and perform. And there's already enough pressure in a postseason they have to go out and perform, especially the giant wide receivers who pretty much have carried the offense this year. So who knows what kind of psychological effect it had, but clearly they were pressing. Clearly they dropped passes that they normally don't drop, and obviously that all unfolded early in the game. So, you know, if Odell Beckham Jr. catches that third and five pass play and the Giants get a first down and instead of punting, they wind up scoring later in that drive, and then he or Shepard catches the touchdown passes, well, now suddenly a quarter into the game, you're like, all right, well, that, that was much to do about nothing. Look, see, these guys are, you know, making plays all over the place. But when it went the other way, uh, it, it changed the narrative, and I'm sure those guys felt pressure internally. And Odell Beckham Jr. did not have a great game. In post-game, he started to make headlines for his actions, punching a hole in the wall. Is this guy just really over-the-top passionate, or is this another sign of immaturity by him? Uh, well, it's both. He is extremely passionate. Uh, there, There is no taking away from his passion for playing the game. He burns to be great, and you want players like that. You know, not just the Giants. There's a lot of teams around the NFL that over the years have had talented players, and you sit there and you say to yourself, man, if this guy would only do more, you know, uh, you know, Ruben Randall's a perfect example. That guy had all the tools to be a fantastic receiver. But he didn't appear to burn to be great, and he was met with mediocre results that would leave you always wanting more. He'd show you the brilliant and then just disappear, which is why he wasn't even in the NFL this year after getting cut by Philly. So Odell Beckham Jr. has that passion, but now there has to be uh, a growing up maturity curve that comes along. And when Jerry Reese, who is as close to the vest as anybody, the Giants general manager, says it publicly, then you know that it's something that's concerning the team. Voice of the Giants, Bob Papa with us right here, 104.5, the team you're home for New York sports. Bob, when you, when you look at this season as a whole, you know, there's been some questionable stuff, but it's a, it's a success for the franchise, right? I mean, after back-to-back six and tens and a new coach and a rookie head coach coming in, and then, you know, what they did in free agency, which, let's face it, that does not happen often, where everybody that you sign turns out to play at the expectation level, if not above the expectation level, uh, then it's a huge success. And it's something to build on for next year. But there's certain areas that have to be addressed in order for this team to be able to take it to yet another level. And let's talk about that offseason. Priority number one for the New York Giants in this offseason should be what? Well, first I would try to see if I can re-sign some of my own. Uh, I, I would hope that they can figure out a way to sign a guy like Jonathan Hankins. You know, we saw when they let Barry Cofield go uh, after he was part of the Super Bowl team, and then they drafted Linval Joseph, but then they let him go. And, and in that time, they've spent a lot of money on free agents with mixed results kind of filling that spot as opposed to just paying a lot of money to the guy that you have. And I think when you look at this defense this year and what Hankins and Damon Harrison did, do you want to go out and tip your toe into the water of the draft again and hope that you're going to draft a guy that's like Jonathan Hankins or is he going to be like Marvin Austin? Uh, so I, I would like, I would try to keep, keep the known 
I'd make sure I figured out a way to keep Dominic Rogers Cromarty uh, based on whatever his number is going to be next year. And I think you want to try to re-sign Jason Pierre-Paul and keep him in the fold. And I would keep one or two of these linebackers that they signed as, on one-year deals as well. So that would be priority number one. Priority number two is fixing the offensive line and making it better. And then they've got to get a tight end. I mean, it, this, this, this sort of uh, going with these undrafted free agent guys or these low-round picks who are projects, this offense needs a threat in the middle of the field to stop teams from playing that two deep safety shell coverage that just killed the Giants this year. Bob Papa with us right now, voice of the Giants. So, Bob, when you when you look at uh, Eric Flowers, we, we've met him, we've talked to him a couple times. Love the guy a, as a person. Is is he the left tackle moving forward? I don't think they know that at this point. Um, look, I know they. I know Jerry spoke yesterday and he said, "Look, he's still a very young player," which he is. As he came out early as a junior, he's just 22 years of age. But if you want to look at it objectively, where was the improvement from year one to year two? I mean, year one, he played through an ankle injury. He showed tremendous toughness. He showed raw ability, and he showed flaws. It feels as if none of the flaws really got corrected or have been improved upon. And that comes on him. I mean, he had a great offensive line coach in Pat Flaherty as a rookie. Now they brought in Mike Solari, uh, who is another veteran, legitimate, big-time offensive line coach. And the player looks the same. So, uh, to me, that now turns back to the player. And is he willing to commit himself to make the changes in his game to make him better? And they're going to have to make that determination. And, uh, and the fact that Jerry Reese left that open for debate um, you know, tells you what they think that that what we're all talking about isn't that far from the truth. Bob, when when you look at you brought up Jason Pierre Paul and trying to resign him, when he says something to the effect of, you know, no more one year deals for me, I, I've proven with seven and a half fingers I can do what normal guys can do. Do you think he prices himself out of New York? That's a possibility. That is a possibility because remember, um, you know, you got some other guys that you know you're going to want to keep going down the road here, you know, Justin Pugh, uh, he's going to have an expiring rookie deal coming up. Uh, Odell is going into his fourth year, you know, as a, as a, as a first round draft pick, obviously, um, you know, you've got that fifth year option on him. So they still have him under some sort of cost control. Uh, but then Landon Collins, you got to think about him two years from now, uh, because he was a second round pick. So you got to start thinking about, the salary cap, not just in 17, but in 18 and 19 and other guys you have to keep. My fear is that the Giants are going to make a legit, will make a legitimate offer. But as you guys well know, there's always one team that, you know, will blow a guy out of the water. And if it gets to a certain number, the Giants might just feel that it's cost prohibitive. And, and I, quite honestly, I think his best place in, you know, maybe if his agent and um, you know the people around him take a look at it, he better be—he's got to be careful where he goes because he's not the same player he was before his injury. He's not the same player he was in 2010 and 2011. Um, and now he has done remarkable things in coming back, and this year proved that he's better than he was last year when he had to deal with everything. But there are still some plays that he can't make because of the injuries that he sustained. And, you know, if he gets a ton of money to go to a team that has a bad defense and no pass rushers and people are expecting him to be sort of a one-man dominating show, they could be gravely disappointed. Now that the New York Giants season has ended, what is life like for Bob Papa? Do you get some time to relax now for the next few weeks? No. Are you kidding me? <laughs> no. No, 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 no. My Golf Channel contract now kicks in. Oh, nice. As a matter of fact, a matter of fact uh, tomorrow I'll be heading to Orlando for the Diamond Resort Invitational, which we got that, and then the PGA Tour opens the following week. Bob, for some people, they would still talk about golf being some relaxation. So it's not so bad <laughs> that you're out there covering I, golf. Not too bad. It's not bad. No, at least I'm going to some warm weather spots. But, you know, not being around with the kids and all that other yeah. stuff, you know, yeah, that's the one thing about great. I mean, the road trips are one day. You leave on Saturday, you play the game on Sunday, you come home Sunday night or Monday night game, you leave on Sunday. 
you, know, you start getting into some of the other sports, the, the travel becomes extensive, and I got a full golf schedule coming up. So I'll be busy. Bob, real, real quick, were you were you on the plane with the Giants? Because they're they're refuting the uh, reports that the plane was uh, was trashed. Uh, yeah, we exit from the back, so we didn't walk through the front part of the plane. But uh, I would sort of, you know, just having traveled with teams in the past and and having traveled with the Giants, I would just say that I'm guessing some of those reports about what happened on the airplane was greatly exaggerated. You know, you got the owners on the plane. You got the Maras on the plane. You got the coach on the plane. You got the general manager on the plane. These things are not parties like right. in movies. I mean, mostly the guys want to just go to sleep. <laughs> so, uh, if anybody thinks that it's some North Dallas Forty <laughs> raucous party, uh, that's just not how it works in the NFL and today's NFL. Bob, we uh, we know you're busy, and uh, and we look forward to listening to that Golf Channel. Uh, thank you so much for some time. Anytime, guys.